Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Food Business Schools, Food Biz Plus. I'm Kathy Joran, the director of the Food Business School, and hope you are all doing well today. I'm looking forward to a great discussion this morning. The Food Business School, if you are not aware, is the CIA's graduate and executive education division of uh, uh, which has been recently launched uh, just about three years ago. Our mission is to enable and empower our students to design, deliver, and lead transformative innovations that address the world's most pressing food challenges and its greatest business opportunities. And we do that through a variety of programs, including our Food Biz Plus uh, webinar series here. Uh, today, we are going to be talking a special guest, Steve Howard. And uh, at the end of our conversation uh, with Steve, I'll be talking a little bit about our newest program through Food Business School. So please stick around for just a couple minutes so I can tell you a little bit about that. During our program, this uh, our conversation this morning uh, or this afternoon, depending on where you are, um, you can ask questions throughout this program by entering them uh, into the chat, which should be at the bottom of your page there. We do have some questions that you've sent in in advance, and we're trying to address those throughout the program. But again, if we're not answering your question, please feel free to type it in, and we'll try to get to it. So at this point, I'd like for Steve to join us, and I will introduce him. And there we Hello. Go. Hi, Steve. Hi. Everybody, welcome Steve Howard. Steve is the founder and CEO of Appanite Inc. Steve started his career working as an applied mathematician at Stanford Research Institute. He left Stanford Research Institute to pursue life as an entrepreneur, founding and growing innovative companies in the software, internet, mobile applications, and digital advertising industries. In recent years, he's developed Ad Sciences, a methodology and technology that helps companies achieve success through Facebook advertising. Through this journey, he has immersed himself in understanding how digital advertising can produce measurable and valuable results in a wide range of industries, including events, online gaming, health and wellness, restaurants, consumer packaged goods, fashion, and food and beverage. Steve works with me and our Food Business School team and the CIA so we wanted to share his work with all of you. During our conversation today, Steve will discuss how digital advertising can play a pivotal role in the growth of food-related businesses using concrete examples. Our discussion will cover specific areas where digital advertising can make an impact in business growth, finding the right audience for your venture or product, increasing the value of your customers, discovering the right messaging for different audiences, achieving maximum ROI for digital advertising spends, and more. Learn practical pointers that you can apply to your business as you plan for growth. So um, with that, Steve, is there anything you would like to add about your background uh, to tell to our yeah, thanks. listeners today? Thank you for the introduction. Um... Oh, we can't. Everyone can hear me. <laughs> Good. We got past that. We got past that. The first technical hurdle. Everyone can hear me. Um, there we go. Yeah, I'll just preface uh, pre preface the the conversation here by uh, <laughs> mentioning that uh, in terms of uh, my company and Ad Sciences, which is our service that we provide, uh, advertising service that we, our primary focus is around Facebook advertising, uh, Facebook and Instagram advertising. So it's, you know, there's a little bit of a of a bias. We do work. Uh, we do actually work in AdWords space and in email marketing as well, but um, but our primary focus is around Facebook and Instagram advertising. Um, the other thing I, th I thought I would mention at the beginning here is uh, maybe to kind of prime the conversation is I, I wanted to mention a few examples of businesses that we work with in the food and beverage uh, industry. Uh, that might be uh, interesting, and it's a variety. There's a, a kind of a, a fairly wa wide variety of companies that we've worked with and that we're working with currently. Um, 
I'll give some examples just, you know, again, to that if there's questions or if there's uh, if this triggers some questions, then I'd be happy to answer those as we go through the other subject matter. But um, we've worked quite a bit in wine. Um, it turns out uh, I actually live in the wine country in California, but uh, one of our largest clients was uh, is a company called Fitvine Wine, which was a healthy wine company or is a healthy wine company. Uh, that they focus on producing wines that have less sugar and fewer sulfites and uh, no flavor additives. Uh, we had a very uh, big involvement with them in building their direct-to-consumer online sales, um, which is, has been very successful. They've, they've actually expanded uh, quite, quite, quite a bit into retail now at this point. Um, I, another few examples I want to mention are uh, wineries themselves. We actually work with a number of different California wineries uh, the focus there is on getting people into the winery, building local awareness, building local awareness with tourists that visit the wine country to get people to come and visit their tasting rooms and become wine club members. Um, we work with uh, online wine clubs. Uh, there's a wine club called Bright Sellers we've worked with um, who actually you know, get subscribers to wine shipments that they, that they send every month. Um, so it's kind of a blue apron for wine. And then we did a couple other interesting projects. We did a, we did a project in New York for a pop-up Rosé Museum, which was, was a gigantic success. The museum ran for about three months. Um, they sold, you know, tens of thousands of tickets were sold to the event. It was a 14-room kind of Instagram-ready a space where you could take photos of yourself and your friends and you tasted rosés and you mixed a rosé wine and so it was very very fun and it was a big success and that's going to they're going to repeat that that's there's going to be doing that in multiple cities this year um, and then I think I saw in some of the questions that were submitted that there were some questions about restaurants we have done restaurant launches um, which also have, were quite successful a couple of uh, a restaurant actually in Healdsburg that was launched a uh, brand new restaurant, uh, and it, where, of course, if you're in the restaurant business, that early, those early uh, those early days and weeks are are very very tense and stressful um, because it's very important that you establish some traction quickly, um, or or a restaurant can have a hard time going in the long run. Uh, and we so we did that. We did a launch there, and then and then uh, this very event here, Food Biz Plus. We we do the advertising for Food Biz Plus, so. Probably some of you who, who are here today or are participating today saw ads. Um, those ads were managed by, by ad sciences, by, by my business. Um, and then we've also worked on a broader level with the CIA, um, with, the, with the Culinary Institute, uh, advertising boot camp courses and intensives, we, the weekend courses, and then activities around Copia. So that, and those are some examples. Uh, just the, I'll, I'll just mention a few more that might be relevant, which are uh, we did an energy snack bar company, which was a coffee-based snack bar. We're running, we're running advertising right now for a baby food company that inter that's uh, introducing common allergens to babies um, through through uh, through products. They they sell primarily uh, their products are sold through Amazon, which I, I can comment on that later, like some of the complexities of that, and um, and then very recently we've we've begun out running advertising for a ketogenic meal shake, which is called Sated, S-A-T-E-D. Um, so those are some examples. Um, I, I, hopefully those, you know, give some people some ideas of like what kinds of companies are using digital advertising to, to support their growth. Good to know. Especially those that are related to the food industry, which of course is our focus here and probably most of our listeners focus. So good to know all of that and um, that, that, that your experience runs deep in those areas. So thank you. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the history of digital advertising? Yeah, I think just um, probably it makes sense just because, you know, I, I, I imagine that, you know, some on the call are not advertising professionals. Typically, you know, we're, we're working with businesses. They're, they're experts in their domain. They're experts in food and beverages. Um, less expert in in digital advertising, but just a, you know the arc of digital advertising. It's uh, in some form or another been around for a very long time. If you start with e if you call email digital marketing, which we do, um, which has been around for something like forty five years, 
um, banner advertising has been around for 25 years, you know, and that started with, you know, hot wired and Yahoo, you know, back in like 94, 95, and then Google pay per click advertising, which has been around for now 20 years, um, which then grew into AdWords, which has been around something like, a, like 18 years or so. Uh, and then interesting inflection and in all that was social ads, which is Facebook, you know, so Facebook was the beginnings of that and around 2005. So again, social advertising uh, is is quite different in nature than banner advertising, which is, you know, just a, a kind of one way communication. Uh, when you do social advertising, for better or worse, you have to accept that there's interaction and, there, and there's interaction with your ads, which you can, actually can't avoid. Um, you can't block people from commenting on your ads. Your ads are presented as posts in the, in the news feed. So, you know, the people can comment for better or worse. Sometimes it's very, very advantageous if your product is, is viral and interesting. Um, and the conversations can be very useful to, to marketing your product. Um, and then one other thing I'd, I'd, I think I should mention is that in terms of the kind of history of, of digital is smartphones, which is that was that's a major major inflection that occurred. Mobile advertising, um, which you know really got started around 2007, you know around the time the iPhone was launched. Um, it's very important. The most important thing about it, the the is to is that essentially mobile is a big part of social networking, um, and the cadence and the and the way people interact with with uh, with uh, social networks tends to be very skewed towards mobile. Um, and, and one of the, the main things interesting about that is the frequency with, with which people are exposed to advertisements um, because you're not waiting for someone to sit at a desktop, you know, typically Facebook, I think on average, the, the average user of Facebook accesses Facebook like something like three times a day, um, which means, you know, three times a day, they're, they're, it's possible that you reach them with an ad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, at least I would think. Great. Okay, so let's um, dive in a little bit and hear about, you know, if, if digital advertising is done well, what makes it effective? The, probably, you know, this, the single biggest thing is, the, is targeting, uh, is the ability to target. And, tar and targeting, it's, it's almost scary the, the the types of information and the type of of targeting that you can put together, um, you can target, of course, by demographics, by age, by gender, by geography, but you can target by things like life events. You can target people around their birthdays. You can target people that are recently engaged. You can target people by education levels, uh, and we found with some products, you can some that the thing I mentioned about social. And the fact that people can interact with your ads, you can inflect that conversation, that that interaction by things like education. So we, you know, you'll see. Sometimes we found these interesting examples where we were we were we were exposing people to advertisements without any constraint on their education, and we would get on certain kinds of products, you'd get negative feedback um, because the and probably because the product by its nature required a more educated audience. Uh, and, and what we did is we, we just applied education to the advertising filter and, and, and the commentary became much more positive because it was, you know, the, the product was, it resonated better with an educated audience. So it's an example of, you know, where you might use education level as a constraint on that, on, on your ads and where you're serving them. Um, the other thing about digital is, is your ability to have a relatively high cadence uh, email advertising, email marketing, which can be very effective, is very constrained in terms of, of, of in terms of cadence. It's very easy to cross over and become spammer in the email space. So you know the cadence you can probably you know you you can probably uh, achieve is probably something like you know maybe once or twice a month, and beyond that cadence you become an irritant. That's not true in digital. Uh, the, the ability to test a lot of diverse ad messaging um, is, is, is a very big uh, advantage to digital. Um, many companies don't know how to message their audiences or they don't know how to vary their messages by different demographics in their audience they might, that might be interested in their products. 
So you can test that, that ability to test is, is a big thing. Um, and then the, probably the, the, the last thing I'll say is uh, the ability to measure everything. So traditional advertising, print advertising, very, very hard to measure, to experiment. Um, the ability to experiment and measure and, to, and to, to, to make decisions off of real data is a huge advantage to digital. Um, and, and, and typically we're, we're held to, in advertising sense, we're held to high standards in terms of return on, and demonstrating return on ad spend, demonstrating that you spend a dollar and you make $5, those kinds of, those kinds of metrics, um, they're, they're really important. Um, and they're, they're really important to uh, helping a company decide what an appropriate amount of spend is you know, in advertising. Exactly. And with digital also, you know, it's a, it's a relatively yeah. wide reach. Yeah, that's, that, that's absolutely true. Low cost, right? I mean, there's, there is uh, a use of it. Yeah. Okay, great. So let's talk about um, examples of how some organizations are using digital advertising um, for specific uh, reasons and for specific targeted results. And I know you've talked, you have a whole- Yeah, this, so in terms of you know, what, you, what you can try to achieve um, using digital marketing, it's, there's, a, there's, an ev there's a kind of an evolution that, that happens as companies and brands grow. Uh, and, and the whole idea is to kind of move, move people through a funnel, you know, move people from being strangers to your product and company to becoming loyal repeat customers. And one thing I'll say about it is that it's very important to establish realist, very realistic, realistic objectives for your advertising. Um, you see, sometimes you see companies, they, they overreach when they're early stage. So a company, I mentioned some of these companies, the company that did the, that does the baby food for that. So for exposing babies to allergens, it, you know, many, many people on the, who are on this, on this webinar, probably never heard of them. They're called Inspired Start. So if a company like that, if they're if they start with the the thought that we're going to spend a dollar, we're going to make five dollars, they're going to be very disappointed because their brand, they, they have established no brand awareness yet. Um, and if you just sort of jump to that metric, to that ultimate, which is a very it's a good metric to chase eventually, it's it's sometimes you know it's unrealistic to chase those kinds of of, of metrics early in your business. So here's what we typically do. We say early in a company's life and our product life cycle, let's build brand awareness. Let's get people to come to the website. You know, so let's, let's chase click through rates, cost per click. Let's watch bounce rates. Let's, you know, let's, tr let's track ads. Let's find ads that get people to come and look at the brand and look at the product. And, and, and let's make sure that we don't advertise in a clickbait kind of fashion, you know, meaning we send a bunch of ads that, that tempt people into clicking, they click, they come to the website, they leave, they look at one, they look at zero pages, they stay on the website for one second and leave. So, you you know, in an early stage thing where you're trying to get brand awareness, you want to essentially, yes, yes, you want clicks and you want inexpensive clicks, but you want to make sure they're the right kinds of clicks. So you want to monitor things like bounce rates on ads. That's a, that's a kind of early stage traffic, building awareness. If you move kind of one step up from that, the typical next step in terms of using digital would be and produce something of value, meaning get connected to, to those people that are clicking. And, that, and the, the, the form that takes, a lot, a lot of times we're doing things like email collection. We're getting people to sign up for newsletters. Um, we're getting people to give us their email address to hear about product launch or product special deals, or you know, we give you know, typically you're providing some kind of inducement to get those emails in return for an email address. But that that next stage up from clicks is getting connected, um, and those connections are extremely valuable. Um, having email addresses. It, it they provide a seed for all sorts of audiences you would use in advertising. Um, fans are are kind of related. Facebook fans in the Facebook space, fans are somewhat similar to email addresses. 
because it, you know nowadays back in the early days people would like business pages willy nilly um, nowadays people are more selective you know they, their news feed is full of this stuff they you know they don't want a news feed full of all kinds of businesses sending them ads and sending them messages so they're more selective so a fan you know, of a page is actually we we found is a relatively valuable asset so you know, producing those fans, producing email addresses, that's a very valuable objective as a, you know, kind of a second level. And then as and then as things evolve, you, you, then you shift to sales. You know, typically you, at that point you're gonna you're gonna shift to a focus on let's get let's get return on ad spend. Let's actually make you know convert visitors into purchasers. Um, that that activity is is very typically very reliant on on retargeting um which we're all exposed to every day uh, we all we all see these examples if you go to amazon and you click on a product and a minute later it's in your news feed you know there's an ad for that product in your news feed um it's yeah it, but it's it, it turns out to be you know crucially important uh you know there you know it's you usually you achieve all your return ads spend through retargeting or the vast majority of it um, so you get someone to come and look, they come and look a few times and then you retarget to them and that's where you see conversion typically. Um, but, and then one other thing I'll say about direct, about sales, about that, that objective, when you're driving sales, you're not always selling on your website. Um, there's a lot of partners we have, a lot of people, a lot of companies we work with, they sell events. We do a, a big food event. It's called bacon and beer, which is a lot of fun. It's, it's in big stadiums, it's in, in ballparks, and it's in big you know, venues. Um, they sell th those, those events, which are in various cities, they travels around the United States. Um, they, they're selling through Eventbrite. So you know, we're actually, we're not sending to their website, we're sending to Eventbrite, and we're trying to convert people in Eventbrite to buy tickets. Um, another company we work with sells all through Amazon. It's, that's a very challenging environment. Amazon does not, would allow you to instrument anything so you can you can't do retargeting for example on Amazon so it's a, it's a challenging environment to work in where you don't have control over um, over all of the instrumentation and where you can't exploit the instrumentation and I'll I'll, just, I'll, I'll, I'll mention like two other or, or two or three other ways that digital advertising is is useful for a business um, so once you get to a purchase, and a lot of products, particularly food products and particularly new food products, innovative food products, people will try them once and never come back. And so encouraging repeat purchasing because it's a behavioral change. It's, that's what it seems to us. It seems that someone will try something, it's a novelty, it sounds interesting, but they don't make it part of their lifestyle. So once you get start building up a set of people that are buying through your advertising, you, you usually the evolution is to focus on how do we get repeat purchases? You know, how do we get loyal, stick, start getting loyalty uh, built? Now, that's true around things like that ketogenic diet, you know, product I mentioned, Sated, which is called Sated, that product, you know, they, again, it's a lifestyle, it's a diet, it's, you know, people get lazy, they don't stick with their diets. And sometimes advertising can form, a, can just be a memory jogger or encouragement to return to you know, use the product again, and then kind of related to that is is we do these we do campaigns around bring bring back, so th those campaigns are usually built around someone who bought more than once. If you have a product like this where where you would re buy the product again and again, so someone that buys once and never comes back, maybe they just don't like your product. You know, they didn't like the way it tasted, or they just you know it didn't appeal to them. So that's that's not as interesting as someone who bought say twice and hasn't bought for three months. So you can build campaigns around that objective of saying, let's get people that already look like they like the product, they bought it more than once, but they haven't bought for a while. So let's encourage them, let's build a campaign to encourage them to come back and buy again. Um, and then a lot of what happens in food, um, a lot of these companies we work with, they might start because it's hard to get into retail they might start with a direct to consumer, you know, sell online, get some traction, demonstrate traction on the product, you know, have some credentials, have some you know, credibility with the product, and then try to get into retail channels. And 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 with those when we work with those companies, we then 
we typically will run campaigns around getting people to go to the retail locations, support the retail efforts. Because you know, to stay in retail, you have to be successful. People have to come looking for your product. They have to you know, come in and the store has to see the merchandising, merchandise moving. So we do a lot of advertising around local awareness. Those campaigns are, they're run within like a mile radius of a store. You know, so we have um, some of these, some of the products I mentioned, they're in a lot of retail locations and we actually run campaigns that target, they might target 200 stores and each of those campaign, each each of those audiences that we're targeting, we're only targeting within a mile of the store. So we're trying to get someone to you know get in their car or walk and go to the store and purchase the product. So that, so those are examples of you know sort of evolution of how you might use digital advertising. Which also really works and applies to food businesses, right? To restaurants or yeah, and, and, and yeah, and I'll mention one thing about that. So, the, so a little challenging in that regard is when you're looking at at um, bricks and mortar and getting. I mentioned wineries. Um, it gets harder to measure. It becomes more anecdotal, right? Where you say, "I ran the ad campaign. I we had a, you know, there's a winter wineland event. Okay, so and there's hundreds of wineries you could go to." And we're going to advertise for a winery because we want, you know, that's our client. We want them to go to that winery. Um, so it's, it's, it, it becomes, it's a little harder to, or it's, it's a quite a bit harder to track, right? Because you don't have a conversion event. You know, someone's not going to walk in and report that they saw the ad on Facebook or it's unlikely. Um, so it, it's a little bit harder to measure. But, you know, what we find is that usually you're looking at comparing like, volume, you know, transaction, in the, in the case of wineries, you know, they're typical, they count headcount winery visitors always. So they'll say, we typically have during this event, we have 100 people visit, we had 150 people visit. Um, and then we attribute it to the advertising. It's not exact, but it becomes a little bit more challenging. Well, there's also the option of, uh, feedback, you know, from re requesting feedback from your customers, right? I mean, I get a evaluation request from every single thing that I do these days, from going to the dentist to every uh, place that I eat. And so- Yeah, yeah, and, and, and the other way to do it is, you know, typically the, the one one trick in doing this is, you know, some inducement that where you have to, you have to say you saw it. So it says, you know, come for a free tasting and let us tell us you saw the ad that says you get a free tasting because our normal tasting is ten dollars. So, so then people are, you know, they walk in and they say, I saw the ad and I want my free tasting. Right. You know, so claiming those kinds of rewards uh, is a way to track. Yeah. Good way. Let's look at this question here from Zachary Garza, um, which says, uh, let's see. We mentioned the cost efficiency of digital advertising, especially social marketing compared to conventional channels. As bigger incumbent firms continue to grow the demand of these digital demand on these digital and social channels, how do you see this affecting the ROI for these channels? And what do you see as the emerging iterations of current channels or a disruptive channel that will become the next <laughs> best value marketing channel in the digital space? Maybe, yeah, uh, I mean that's that's a lot. I mean that, that's a whole, there's a whole hour there, but um, no, the, the the where you do see that you know so, some of, some of what's in that question, um, you see things like uh, Black Fridays you know, around Black Friday. It can be depending on you know who how big your company is, how big your ad budget is, you can be at a great disadvantage in in certain you know in around certain kinds of 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 triggering events like that. Um, big companies spend big around, you know, holidays, around Black Fridays, around, and, and particularly when their product is, you know, resonates with that particular event. So sometimes we just don't advertise. I mean, for a small company, we, we actually reduce the ad spend because we're, we're in a, we're at a competitive disadvantage um, and it's very unlikely we can out, outspend. The cost of reach, the cost of everything goes up uh, as soon as your cost of reach goes up, which it always does, for I, I'll stick with that example, Black Friday example, cost, CPM cost per thousand reach, it goes up some sometimes dramatically. Depends on the product, but it, it, but if you're in a space where you're competing with, 
you know, Frito-Lay or you're competing with big, big companies, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Um, with regard to like disruptive, the, the, the disruptive elements are, are, they're already there. You know, there's, there's always new social. Um, there's, there's things like Nextdoor, which is, you know, a, a neighborhood social network. Um, which has advertising, which is, you know, going to be ad supported. It's, you know, it's a pretty early stage, but it's pretty interesting. So that, for example, like a restaurant that, you know, that's, it's probably very, very cost effective to use that as a, as a platform. Uh, it might be more cost effective than Facebook. Um, in general, I'll say, I'll comment on in terms of economics. Facebook is in general, much more affordable than AdWords. Um, AdWords tends to be a very competitive space. And again, it, it, it varies, depends on what, what you're selling, um, but keywords can be very expensive. Um, you know, and, and again, if you're, if you're in a space where your competition has deep pockets, it can become prohibitively expensive to, you know, to play in that space. Um, but in general, Facebook, which is more of a push media, um, it's, it can be very affordable. Thank you. Okay, so let's um, hear some practical advice about architecting, launching, and optimizing effective and cost-effective ad campaigns, which is yeah. a big piece of what you you are. Right. Um, first thing I would say is is you know don't 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 overreach. Um, we get involved with businesses that are. They're small businesses or they're medium-sized businesses. They have limited resources. And, and by that, I don't mean just money. I mean, people, time. Um, and they read all these stories about advertising and all these different platforms. And they want to do Facebook advertising and AdWords and Twitter and Instagram and Pinterest. And they want to do every single you know social platform. Typically, those fail badly, you know, because all of those different social platforms they all are different, a, a bit different, or, or sometimes a lot different. Twitter is quite a bit different using that as an advertising media or as an advertising platform from Facebook. It's very high engagement. If you aren't prepared to engage or to, and to react really quickly, meaning you're on it all the time, you, you know, the half-life of a tweet is like an hour, you know, so you can't have someone tweet something or ask you a question and not respond to it. You have to respond to it in three minutes. So, those, you know, that puts a lot of a, a lot of a burden on your resources. So we usually say, and it's not just because we do Facebook advertising, you know, but because that's the space we work in. But we say just stay focused. You know, try try to get good at something. You know, try to get good on a platform and try to figure out how to make it work for your business before you spread yourself too thin. Um, the other thing I'll say is, no matter how early stage you are, get everything instrumented. You know, get your website instrumented. The, the instrumentation, you know, Facebook Pixel, which tracks and allows you to retarget, it's extremely valuable. The earlier you instrument your site, the better, because everyone that visits your site becomes a potential customer and and someone that you can reach. You know, and di dynamically that audience will grow. But lots of times when we get involved, there's no instrumentation. You know, there no one's been you know tracking trying to instrument who comes to the site, um, which means you're starting from zero. And so it can take a while to build up um, the ability to do retargeting. And retargeting, you know, a lot of it's around things like um, purchase intent that doesn't convert to purchase. A lot of retargeting is around somebody added something to a cart or they initiated a checkout and they didn't check out. Those audiences, when you retarget those audiences, which requires instrumentation, when you when you when you retarget them, that's where all of your sales come from. I would say all all those examples I gave of companies, the vast majority of their return on ad spend is comes off audiences that are that are something like initiated a checkout yesterday and didn't finish it. That could be because they got distracted, their kids came home from school. It could be a million reasons why they didn't do it, but those audiences typically rise to the top in terms of generating return on ad spend. So you want to make sure that your sites are instrumented, your website's instrumented properly so that you can, you know, you can actually use that data. Steve. Yeah. So the instrumentation I'm referring to is that there's tracking pixels. It's very easy to do. 
it's a you know it's a little line of code if you have a you know if you have someone who's who's managing your website they can do it in in 30 seconds so it's a snippet of code you put onto your website that has a has a, in the case of facebook this is it's called facebook pixel the pixel reports events back to facebook so it says so that when you're looking at your ad campaigns later you can see that a certain ad generated someone who came they came and you can build events up you can build a funnel of events where you say that this many people came that the pixel reported that event back to facebook i know which ad it came from i know which audience it came from right so that so that's extremely valuable information and then i can say that things i was mentioning someone put something in a cart and they didn't check out so that gets reported back through that facebook pixel to the ad campaign so now the ad campaign has all these events. It is, it's, it's getting informed about which ads and which audiences are actually producing something of value. So, so, so a few other things that I, I would say in terms of like entering in, like if you're, if you're thinking of this or even if you're doing it right now is um, to take full advantage of digital, uh, digital advertising. One of the great strengths is the ability to test a, a broad diversity of ad creatives. So when you're starting out, we see also um, a common mistake is let's do split tests where we check, we change one word in our ad and see, you know, if it works better than th this other word. Um, you, you can chase, you know, you can spend an enormous amount of time and not learn much doing it that way. So you want to do that as kind of a top down exercise, very diverse messaging. Um, if you're if you're selling a product that has a health component to it, do a bunch of creative, do creative around the health messaging. If it's, if there's a lifestyle thing around it, you know, it, meaning it's easier like that, like that, um, like this a satiety smoothie, easier to, to, to get with your ketogenic diet by a shake versus cooking something. So it might be like that, like a lifestyle, improving your lifestyle, making your life easier. But you want to do real, you should do it very consciously. You know, very consciously decide. I'm going to test health as a messaging. I'm going to tell. I'm going to. I'm going to test the lifestyle messaging, and and the same thing applies to imaging. You know, don't don't try to do like very very subtle changes. Try to do dramatically different imaging in the beginning to say, is it a do images of people work much better? Is, do abstract images work much better? And, and even things like color. You know, the color has a huge can, can have a huge impact. So test, you know, red and green and like dramatically different colors, mm -hmm. you'll see trends, data will inform you. You know, when you look at that kind of testing, you'll find out that for whatever reason, red works really good, you know, on our product. And, and you and you, you want to get those learnings, you want to learn as much as you can. There's always this kind of, we call it learning versus earning. You know, there's always a, one thing about digital advertising is there's a huge amount of opportunity to learn things. Um, that, that and and of course, yeah, you want to make money on your advertising, but sometimes the things you learn, like learning your messaging, is extremely valuable. So even if your return on ad spend goes, sometimes the return on ad spend we intentionally let it go where it goes, let it go down, because we want to learn. We want you know the 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 company wants to know how do I relate to my audiences? What's the right way to tell them the story? And they don't know. So in that case, your return on ad spend might suffer, but you might learn something that's extremely valuable down the road, you know, which applies to everything you do in your business, not just to advertising. So that's a, that's a real key thing. Yeah, go ahead. And when you're, so, and when you're testing those different messaging uh, in multiple ads at the same time, then you can zero in on the ones that are really working and reaching the right audiences. Yeah, and, and so that's the other, so, so if you think advertising. about ad campaign as a matrix, you know, and that we actually represent them that way. So uh, we have this ad matrix and ad matrix in, in our product, our tool, um, ad science tool. So the columns in the matrix are ad creatives, the rows are audiences. And, and you, you wanna spend a lot of time thinking about audiences. People, you know, the lot, lots of times, if you try to be too, um, you know, too literal in your audiences, you miss a lot of opportunities. Um, so I, I'll give an example. So uh, that company, Fitfine, we don't 
we don't advertise fit fine wine that the, the key audiences were not people that are interested in wine okay so you're saying okay we're selling wine let's 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 you know let's go for people that are interested in chardonnay those audiences were don't work very good with fit fine wine what works good is people that are into pilates it's people that are in crossfit cycling it's people that have migraines so when you think about you know again think about what i said about the about the ad creatives the ad creatives for them show someone cycling. Yeah, it has a product placement thing. It has maybe it's a dip tick and it shows a wine bottle, but the, the, they're getting through to people through a lifestyle image and a lifestyle message. Um, and, and the other thing that was interesting is with regard to that matrix I described, test all the ad creatives against all the audiences. Don't try to have a preconceived notion. Many times when we get involved with companies that have already been doing advertising, we'll see this kind of checkerboard where they said, I think this ad is only going to be interested to, interesting to people that are newly engaged or people that have a birthday. So they'll have, they'll have a preconceived notion of an ad creative. They think they've figured it out. What we find without fail, if we take that ad and we run it across all the audiences, there's, you know, there'll be a bunch of situations where the ad works that weren't being tested previously. So, when you when you approach the whole thing, you think, be really creative, really brainstorm, think about your audiences, think broadly, don't just think about like a literal thing. I'm selling a coffee based snack bar. So I'm going to I'm going to yes, the, I'm going to have the audience in there that people are interested in coffee. But there's a lot of other you know possible ways to go after the people that, and, and you might get surprised. You know, you might find out it's people that have have young kids, you know, it, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with. The product, you know, that that literal product, you know, definition like it's coffee based. I, I, I thought of an example, another example of that, which was really interesting. I mentioned that Rose Mansion, the Rose Mansion, which was, you know, this pop up Fifth Avenue, New York uh, Museum, pop up Mu Rose Museum. We marketed to teachers because the Rose Museum was during when school was out and there was afternoon time periods when most people are working except for teachers who are off. So, and that audience worked really good until school got back in session. And then the audience completely failed, you know, because they were all teaching, they were busy teaching. Um, so that's, an, I'm giving that example is, you know, kind of think outside the, the literal box that you think your product fits in and, and you might discover like very interesting affinities and, and, um, and audiences that work for your product. Great. Yeah, so many things to think about and so many ways to think differently about uh, advertising or audiences that are really important and that there are so many possibilities with digital advertising that makes it easy to sort of customize or make changes Versus yeah, and, and when where you don't get any, you don't get any data back. You know, the key here is that this this is you know digital environments are an environment where you can measure and learn, and and that's the way you should think. You know, you should always think as every day when you look at your campaigns, you should always be learning. You should always be looking at it and saying because one one other thing I wanted to say about that about you know ad creatives against audiences, it's never there. I've never seen once in hundreds of campaigns that that I've managed. I've never seen a single campaign where there was a winner, where a ad was the best ad period. Um, it's always a checkerboard. There's always an ad works in six audiences and doesn't work in the other 44. You know, that's just a very, that, that's the way it always ends up. You know, so, you, you know, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna turn out that, you know, for each audience, there might be a very different message or a very different set of images that work for them. Um, so, you know, always be looking at that stuff, always be looking at, you know, measuring and learning, um, because that's going to inform the other thing about advertising is you exhaust people with advertising, um, and ad exhaustion is a, is a real thing. And you can't just keep feeding the same ad to, to people, you know, for months and months and months, you're going to irritate them. They're going to get tired. They're not going to see the ad at all. Um, so that measure and learn cycle is how you you know take real data and say that we know we think we know we've learned or we're learning what kind of messaging and what kind of imagery works for each audience 
and use that to inform the next cycle, the next creative cycle, um, which, you know, you're, which, and you should always be looking, thinking ahead like that. You should always be thinking, I need to refresh my ads. You know, I'm gonna have to refresh my ads sooner or later. And I should always be every day thinking, what am I learning from this data about messaging that works for a particular audience? Right, which messaging works for, right. for the audiences and which new audiences you might have identified through the process, right? <clears throat> Good. So um, we are nearing the end of our time. I don't see any additional questions. Uh, let me just double check here. Do you have an API or form? What does it say? <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have an API or a form of uh, the, the, what our, our particular platform is built on Facebook APIs, you know, extensive set of Facebook APIs. So, you know, we're gathering data through APIs every night um, and, and, and tracking data. And, and the methodology that I described is, is de facto a massive split test. You know, so typical campaign, we might be running at one time 20 or 30 ad creatives against let's say 20 or 30 audiences. So there's you know 900 cells, let's say in the matrix that they're all getting scored every night. We, we actually use what's called a genetic algorithm. So every night those scores, it says this ad is working really good in this audience, let's give it more budget. And so it's de facto testing, split testing, right? Every audience has seen 20 ads. There's two real big winners in there. There's 18 losers. The 18 losers they get starved of budget. <laughs> the two winners get fed, and that's you know, and that cycle over time, you end up with a really efficient <laughs> campaign. Yeah. yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, and and Zach Garza comments uh, on iterative design thinking, which uh, is you know, such a, a new methodology that people are using these days for solving problems in their businesses, and which is a key component of our uh, Master Professional Studies program, which I'll talk about in just a couple minutes. So thank you for that, Zachary. Um, Anna Nora says, uh, any recommendations for launching a product, which um, I think a lot of what you've covered has, has uh, Talked, spoken to that, but maybe is there any specific uh, that you it, might it somewhat depends on what you know where what launch this? means. Uh, I think um, an example of of what you might do. What we have done things around Indiegogo campaigns, where there's a new flavor being launched and is being run through Indiegogo or Kickstarter campaign. Um, the, in those environments, or if that's part of a launch, you know, the launch plan. Right. Um, the thing I mentioned about email collection is really important um, that when you're in those crowd crowdfunding kind of configurations on a product you, you need to be successful in 24 hours or 48 hours um, if you don't achieve that kind of traction fast that that's your campaign is probably not going to be successful so we do a lot you, you do a lot of pre-work around get addresses get people that you can go after before the actual launch you know you don't want to start with zero at the launch you know you you know, mostly you, you, you want to show traction in most environments where where you're, you know, you, you, you don't want to be in a situation where you sell one and then you sell one the next day. You know, you want to you want to get set up so that you can the first day you launch, you're selling 50, you know, and, and there's ways to do that by you know, getting people to connect to you before you do that. And there's ways to do that by you know, getting people to connect to you before you do the launch. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Steve. We appreciate your time today and all of your expertise and insights and sharing that with our audience here. Um, we're going to sign off now. And I'm going to uh, ask everyone to stay on for just a moment while I tell you a little bit about uh, our next session coming up in March, as well as our, our a new Master Professional Studies program. But once again, Steve, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. And hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you. Okay, everyone. I uh, just wanted to mention that our next Food Biz 
Plus will be taking place on Wednesday, March 27th, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, and we'll be talking about consumer insights with Colleen McClellan from Data Central, who has incredible insights and is a wonderful speaker. So I think uh, you would enjoy her. Please join us for that Food Biz Plus. Uh, you'll be getting a uh, email from me with a recording of today's session and the link to Food Biz Plus Consumer Insights. You can also find that link on our website at foodbusinessschool.org. Then I'd like to tell you uh, just briefly about our Master of Professional Studies in Business program. This is a new graduate degree that we've launched at the CIA last fall. Our first cohort is a full cohort in their second semester of this program. And as I uh, briefly mentioned, one of the courses they're taking right now um, is Design Thinking for Food, which is a really exciting uh, program for them, along with Ethical Leadership in Food Business. Uh, there are a whole variety of courses included in this program, but those are two that uh, are actually in process right now. This program is a one-of-a-kind online master's degree business program with a food industry focus. Whether you're an entrepreneur looking to open a restaurant or other food service business, or if you want to launch a new food product, or just further your understanding of the food business in order to contribute to your organization or move up within your organization, this is a great program for you. You can work on this program. You can um, actually take this program from anywhere in the world because it's online primarily, and you can, can it's designed to be done while you're working at your current job. It takes uh, two years, takes place over two years, four semesters, taking two courses online at a time, and then a couple of other um, short sessions, as well as three short in-person sessions on our uh, campuses that are one week or less, two in California and one in New York. So uh, if this interests you, please go to our website at ciachef.edu forward slash masters. All the details are there. You can reach out to me. I'm happy to talk with anyone who's interested in this program. We're currently accepting applications for the fall 2019 start date which will start um, with the in-person week in Napa in August, and the courses actually start in September. So uh, right now we are actively, as I mentioned, accepting applications, and we would look forward to receiving one from any of you who would be interested in taking this program. Thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I can be reached at Kathy at Food Business